Welcome to PT754. In this particular presentation, we'll discuss part two of diagnostic imaging for physical therapists. In part one, we discussed the usefulness of plain film radiography. And in this particular presentation, we'll speak about more advanced uh, methods of diagnostic imaging, including MRI, CT scan, and bone scan. So prior to discussing some of the specifics in terms of advanced diagnostic imaging and how it relates back to physical therapy, I think it's important just to understand, understand the landscape of where we're at in terms of advanced diagnostic imaging and medical practice. There's no question that advanced diagnostic imaging has been vital in helping us diagnose and understand pathology much sooner in so many patients. However, there are some concerns that sometimes advanced diagnostic imaging is overutilized and sometimes the benefits of the imaging are often questioned. And there are a couple different reasons for that. The evidence basis for advanced imaging is somewhat incomplete and imaging practice is still oftentimes driven by habit or anecdote instead of clinical practice guidelines or even the American College of Radiology's appropriateness criteria. And there's always a concern with liability. So we see physicians requesting uh, advanced imaging, um, just sometimes over concern that there could be pathology uh, that is present and they're just not picking it up. And so, and if they don't pick it up, there would be concerns over liability issues with that. And then in terms of uh, diagnostic imaging and the content that we sometimes see in medical school, um, sometimes we don't see as much education for physicians in terms of when to utilize advanced diagnostic imaging, especially in musculoskeletal cases. So all of that has really contributed to this overuse and overutilization of diagnostic imaging. And the reason it's important to discuss it here is that you may go to a physician because you, you, you would like to have advanced imaging for one of your patients. However, they may feel sometimes that if imaging is overutilized, they may not allow you to get it. And that could be something that could certainly inhibit quality patient care. And so again, being an advocate for your patient, understanding when imaging is indeed appropriate, especially the advanced imaging that we'll describe in, in this particular talk is really important, even before you have those conversations with physicians who likely are gonna have to order the imaging for you. And so we've already mentioned that advanced diagnostic imaging sometimes can be overutilized. And this particular um, systematic review and meta-analysis certainly supported that. In fact, when we look at patients who have low back pain, we see lumbar imaging being done about 35% of the time when it really isn't necessary, meaning that about 35% of the time advanced diagnostic imaging for patients with low back pain is being ordered, but there really isn't any red flags present. So that kind of backs up that last slide that we talked about, about the overutilization of diagnostic imaging. But the study showed the other side of the coin that in, in patients who are presenting for care uh, for their, their low back pain, about two thirds of the time imaging was not performed um, in, in, in cases where there were red flags being present. And so we see certainly imaging being utilized when it's not necessary. But in this particular study, about 66% of patients um, who actually had red flags didn't get diagnostic imaging. So on one hand, we do have problems with overutilization, but then on the other hand, we have cases where we see diagnostic imaging is necessary, but it may not be done. And so these are patients that may be referred to physical therapy. And so I think it's important that you understand there may be times when we do need advanced diagnostic imaging. It just hasn't been ordered. And it may be just because there's an absence of red flags uh, or, or there are red flags present, but they just haven't been detected uh, by the provider who referred the patient to you. And so this particular slide on the left shows um, a variety of different potential red flags that might be picked up from the history 
in individuals who potentially have low back pain and a sinister cause for it. And if we look on the right, you can see along the top, those are the red flag conditions that we need to be concerned about. We need to be concerned about cancer, we need to be concerned about infection, spinal fractures, inflammatory disorders, and cauticoinous syndrome. And the darkened boxes that you see under each of the conditions that those highlight the questions that are related, the red flag questions that are related to those particular conditions. And so again, that last slide we talked about, imaging is overutilized in about a third of our patients with low back pain, but in about two thirds of our patients who actually have red flags, they're not getting imaged. And so these are the red flag findings that you would get from the history for some of these individual disorders. And so again, it's important to know what those red flag findings may be. And if they're present, correlate that with your tests and measures and perhaps response to intervention that's already maybe been done by you or the physician and determine whether or not diagnostic imaging is in fact necessary for these patients who may have a high likelihood of a, of a sinister pathology causing their low back pain. So in terms of when do we actually order or recommend advanced imaging for, for our patients, I think it's important to really think through how the results of the diagnostic imaging, whether they're positive or negative, will really help inform your management of the patient. And we want to be careful, uh, especially in those cases where imaging is overutilized and there aren't red flags, it's likely that some anatomic abnormalities are likely going to show up, especially on imaging modalities like MRI. And those may not necessarily have a correlation to the patient's current pain complaint. And so these diagnostic imaging findings can really sometimes cause concern for the patient. When we talk about what other factors could be related to that, we sometimes see that when individuals know their diagnostic imaging abnormalities, they sometimes have a decreased self-perception of their health. They may have fear avoidant behavior and they may catastrophize, and all of that may lead to uh, enhancing chronicity in this patient population. So we want to always be cautious to, to place those diagnostic imaging findings in the appropriate clinical context for our patients, and understand as well that diagnostic imaging results are really just one other measure right, that we add to our examination data when we're evaluating patients. Certainly in some cases, it may have more weight than other examination findings, but in general, it should be evaluated in total with our history, our physical examination findings, as well as response intervention. And imaging of the lumbar spine really provides a nice example for how we really pick up abnormalities in individuals who don't even have pain at all. And so we know that if we take diagnostic imaging of the lumbar spine in terms of MRI, if we take you know 150 year olds, we're likely going to find abnormalities in about three quarters of those folks. And so we're going to see findings like stenosis, disc degeneration, bulging, uh, and disc herniations. Um, and these are individuals who don't have any symptoms at all. And the other concern here is that even when we find these diagnostic imaging abnormalities, or what we think are abnormalities, um, they don't in, in folks who don't have pain, they don't necessarily predict the development of low back pain in these individuals either. And so I think well, especially when we start looking at individuals who are a little bit older, we begin to see some of these diagnostic imaging changes. I think we need to look at that just as is imaging findings that are just part of the normal aging process. I don't think that the expectation of having a normal lumbar spine MRI in individuals who are 50 and over is, is really something that our patient should be focused on. Uh, we should help them understand that some of the findings that they have in terms of maybe they have some uh, facet joint, uh, they see some, or I'm sorry, some uh, stenosis in the canal or some of the uh, areas where the nerve roots exit. There may be some changes in the disc uh, in terms of bulging or herniations, but again, these are likely findings that may not necessarily matter in the grand scheme of things. I think we have to be careful how we talk to our patients about this, but certainly at some point it's important for them to help 
for us to help them understand the clinical context of these findings that we see. And many of the patients that we see in physical therapy, you know, for whatever reason, we, we may recommend that they see a specialist like an orthopedic surgeon, maybe a neurosurgeon, maybe a neurologist. I think, you know, before we refer these individuals off, I think it's important that if we think they need diagnostic imaging before we see them, at the very least consult with those specialists uh, to determine what type of imaging they may prefer. In some cases, they may not necessarily need any additional imaging to what's already been done, or they may have uh, imaging at their institution that they would rather have, or they may have some particular focus with respect to imaging and some particular recommendation. So I think that if you're dealing with specialists, just to help optimize a patient's experience, contact the specialist ahead of time, try and get an understanding of what they may want before they see the patient. And that just makes the patient's visit a little better in terms of having all that information present when they see the specialist. So when would we consider diagnostic imaging early? Certainly if there's trauma and there's concern over a fracture or bony alignment or concerns with bony integrity. If, there, if, we're, if we're working with patients who have possible or known malignancy, if we have individuals who have musculoskeletal pain complaints, but they also have constitutional symptoms that are influencing their function in terms of fatigue, fevers, chills, sweats, weight loss, etc. If we have bowel and bladder concerns um, on the part of the patient in terms of function, and if there's objective and progressive neurologic deficits in terms of reflexes, muscle strength and sensation, especially if they're progressive, that really indicates a need for diagnostic imaging. And then when we treat patients who aren't getting better, you know, is there a reason for that that could be potentially explained through some diagnostic imaging findings? So let's begin by talking about computerized tomography or CT scans as it's sometimes referred to. And CT scanning is a type of radiography that produces three-dimensional cross-sectional images of a part of the body. And it's important to note that in terms of when is CT really indicated, I think when you order radiographs for a patient and those radiographs come back normal, but there's still concern for a fracture, and your biggest concern is that bony integrity, CT scan is really the next appropriate modality. It really is less complex, it's easier to get, and less expensive in terms when we compare it to MRI. Uh, the one concern we sometimes do have though is that we are exposing patients to higher doses of radiation compared to conventional radiography. So again, CT scan is a wonderful modality in terms of orthopedic outpatient physical therapy. It is very effective at analyzing bone. It also is effective at analyzing other soft tissues, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. So this particular slide really helps us understand the appearance of representative tissues on X-ray and CT scan compared to MRI. And the two signals that we're talking about here with respect to MRI are T1 and T2 weighted images. Those are two different types of uh, sequencing that we see with magnetic resonance imaging. But let's just take a moment and just talk about CT scans and x-rays. We spoke previously about the different uh, shades of gray um, that we may potentially see with plain film radiography. The same shades of gray, depending upon the radio density of the tissue, really apply to CT scanning as well. Remember, this is a form of radiography. And so the more uh, radio dense a tissue is, the whiter or brighter that tissue is going to appear on CT scan, just like x-ray. And the less radio dense a tissue is, the darker it's going to appear on that CT scan as well as the x-ray. And so in terms of bone, we know that the cortical bone is likely going to be more dense, so that's going to show up whiter than the marrow, which is going to show up uh, more gray. Air and fat are going to be uh, highly uh, radi less radiodense than some of the other tissues. Certainly air, there's no radiodensity there at all, but fat uh, we could potentially see 
um, you know, less radio density there in terms of other other tissues. So that's also going to show up as being black. Uh, it's going to be a little uh, less black, a little bit more on the gray side than air. You'll be able to pick that up. And then water um, is going to be, again, more gray, uh, likely not as gray as bone marrow and definitely not as black as fat, but it's going to be in between uh, that, that particular shade, those particular shades. And so water really con constitutes muscle. And so muscle is going to be a little bit more radio dense than fat, but not as radio dense as bone. And so again, those colors are going to fall out accordingly. And that helps us really identify some of these tissues when we look at uh, CT scan and plain film radiography. And so let's brief, briefly discuss a patient case. This is a 67-year-old man who fell off a horse and reported to a minor injury clinic with severe uh, left-sided knee pain. And so when we look at when we look at uh, the images that we see here, we see an AP of the knee on your left and a lateral view of the knee on your right. And if you look at that AP view where we see the dark circle as well as the arrow, you can see a lucency uh, extending from a superior to inferior directional in that lateral tibial plateau. And that's consistent with a lateral tibial plateau fracture. And so let's go ahead and look at the other slides that relate to CT scans and how they might characterize this fracture a little bit better. So while the fracture was certainly picked up on conventional radiography, the patient was referred to an orthopedic surgeon who wanted to have a little better understanding of the fracture and whether or not the fracture was going to be managed non-operatively or through surgery. And so here are the CT scans. Uh, we see a coronal view uh, on the left and an axial view on the right. And so you can see that fracture much better uh, with the CT scan, certainly on the view on the left. And then that view on the right, which is that axial view, uh, you can pick up uh, that fracture from that different angle a little bit better. Remember, we're looking at different views in, in three dimensions with uh, CT scanning, cross-sectional imaging, if you will. Uh, that's much different than plain film radiography where we don't necessarily get those cross-sectional images. And this just provides a comparison of that coronal CT scan view of the knee uh, on the left and the radiograph on the right. And again, I think you can pick up that fracture line much better on the CT scan than you can uh, with the plain film. This patient ultimately underwent open reduction internal fixation, um, and you can see the hardware placement on the right. And again, the purpose of just presenting this particular case briefly was to help you understand uh, how an image might look on, a fracture might look on a plain film, and how CT can really help you understand the extent of that fracture much better than you can with uh, plain film radiography. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, uses three-dimensional imaging of bone, soft tissues, and pathology. And we don't use ionizing radiation to produce magnetic resonance images. Rather, these are magnetic characteristics. And the main application uh, in terms of clinical diagnostics is really the study of soft tissues of the central nervous system, spine, extremities, as well as bones and joints. And magnetic resonance imaging really has played a key role in helping us understand pathology much quicker in the course of a disorder. Uh, very, very powerful imaging modality. We presented this slide to you previously when we spoke about the different shades of gray that we might potentially see on CT scan or x-ray. And the important point there is it really deals with the degree of radio density and how that uh, particular body region is going to show up in terms of those different shades of gray.
We mentioned previously that when we talk about x-ray, we can talk about these different shades of gray, but it really is optimal if we're discussing films with a colleague or a radiologist to really speak about radio density and whether an area appears to be increased or decreased in terms of radio density. If we talk about a fracture, right, that is an area of decreased radio density through the bone. And we can simply speak about that, uh, and, and that is very, very helpful to help us understand the significance of some of the findings on plain film and CT. When we talk about MRI, MRI, we're no longer going to talk about the degree of radio density in a tissue. Rather, now we're going to talk about whether or not a tissue uh, shows up as being increased or decreased in signal intensity. An MRI has a variety of different sequences associated with it. This T1 and T2 weighted images that you see on this particular slide are two of those sequences that you'll see routinely done pretty much with all MRIs. And these are important because the uh, settings with respect to the magnet and the machine uh, in T1 and T2, they treat these different tissues differently in terms of the color that they produce. And so I think it's easiest if we just talk about what water would show up like, water or blood or edema would show up on these different sequences. And if we look at a T2 weighted image, water is going to show up as bright or high signal. On a T1, water is going to show up as dark or low signal. And the next uh, important structure that we would analyze would be something like fat. Uh, fat is going to show up very, very bright or increased in signal on T1, and it's going to show up grayer or low signal on T2. And if you go up and look at the bony tissue there, uh, that kind of correlates with those findings we see with fat on T1 and T2, meaning that bone marrow is going to show up a little bit higher in signal on T1 than on T2, uh, just because it contains that fat, that fatty tissue. And so again, when we look at MRI, we're talking about varying degrees of signal, and that's based upon the different types of tissues that we see and the sequences that we see on MRI. Anytime we think about these advanced diagnostic imaging modalities, I think it's always important to think about the advantages and disadvantages of these different types of tests. And so some of the clear advantages for MRI is that we get multiplanar images and we really get good contrast in these water dense tissues. And that's sometimes important in terms of identifying pathology. There really are uh, no known health hazards to MRI. Uh, there's a certain uh, couple, couple times when we probably wouldn't want to do it. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we don't see the effects of ionizing radiation like we would uh, with a CT scan or x-ray. And it really is the gold standard imaging modality for soft tissues of the knee, ankle, and shoulder joints, and likely probably the hip as well. And it really is good to evaluate the nervous system. Uh, we can pick up the spinal nerves. We can see things like nerve root compression and peripheral nerve compression and injury. It also images the brain quite well as uh, uh, too. And so disadvantages would be that it is more expensive than x-ray and CT scan. Uh, X-ray is quick. CT scan is really quick. You're in and out of these machines in a matter of minutes. But MRI typically takes almost most of the time about 30 minutes. And so you're in a tube. Uh, these long scan times can cause claustrophobia. And the patient has to remain completely still during the imaging sequencing with MRI. And so any movement at all can really distort the images and really not allow you to evaluate the films adequately. It's hard to find. And so I was a military PT. And so we had a lot of patient care that we did overseas in some of these remote areas. And we never even had MRI there. All we had was x-ray and CT. And so MRI is a challenge. We don't always see it uh, at, at many of the uh, smaller hospitals that we have, and patients have to go to other centers for it. So availability can be an issue. And then when we talk about trauma, uh, bone trauma, I think, again, is best evaluated with uh, CT scan and x-ray. Uh, the reason that we don't pick up bony trauma as much or is easy on MRI, remember that when we talk about those signals of fluid, of water, 
when you have, anytime you have a bony injury, you're going to get bleeding in the area. And that water, uh, whether it's a T1 or a T2 weighted image, that blood, which is really uh, going to show up like water, uh, is really going to help distort, uh, distort some of those fracture lines that we might see, whether it's increased or decreased in signal. And so if we're dealing with bony fractures, I don't know if MRI would be the first modality that I would likely choose. Certainly x-ray followed by CT, but in terms of soft tissue, uh, MRI is really the gold standard for that. So a couple reasons we wouldn't want uh, patients um, getting an MRI just because of the magnetic pull associated with the machine. If patients have metal someplace in the body like a pacemaker or metallic aneurysm clips, uh, these aren't secured very well uh, and they can be pulled by that magnet and uh, could be a catastrophic event for the particular patient. Uh, also, if there's any metal in the body, uh, that would be a concern. Uh, the metal really distorts the images. So in terms of pacemakers and aneurysm clips, those can be pulled out of place by the magnet. Uh, but if we're dealing with with, uh, let's say, shrapnel type injuries. We sometimes saw these individuals to the military, they may have had shrapnel inside their knee. Uh, they didn't know the extent of it sometimes, but it was in their knee, and that'll absolutely, absolutely just distort the images, and so you can't have those. So if there's any concern over any metal in a patient's body that they're unaware of, especially metal workers with the face, uh, you'd probably want to do a pre-screening radiograph to determine if metal is there. That'll certainly pick up. Metal is very radio dense and it'll show up as bright white on those x rays. Uh, if individuals are claustrophobic, uh, they really can't use a routine MRI scanner. Uh, there's open air MRIs, but my understanding with those is that the images may not be as good. Um, and so, certainly, it's better for the patient, but we may not get the detail that we sometimes need. And then, in terms of pregnancy, I think that you know pregnancy is a relative contraindication, uh, relative precaution, uh, depending upon what the MRI is being used for. There may be a need for it, but there aren't any studies that have been done that have really evaluated whether or not the magnet is truly safe for the mom and the baby uh, during pregnancy. So in that particular case, I think it's a good discussion to have uh, with the physician. We mentioned previously about the different sequences associated with MRI and that we call these T1 and T2 weighted images. Uh, these are the most uh, common imaging techniques that we'll see on MRI. Uh, in terms of, again, the colors that we see associated with these and whether or not we're dealing with high or low signal in terms of tissues, T1 weighted images, let's start with um, fat on those because fat is going to show up as white or bright or high signal and that's going to correlate back to bone marrow being bright or high signal as well water uh, is going to actually appear lower signal it's going to appear gray on on mri with these t1 weighted images and cortical margins cortical bone will also appear as dark and t1 weighted images are really great for just identifying anatomy just studying anatomical structures. They're great for that. T2 weighted images, let's go back to that water component. The water is going to be bright uh, or high signal. Uh, that's going to uh, also kind of correlate with what we see with respect to fat. The fat is going to be gray or lower signal. And again, that's going to make the marrow uh, gray as well. Cortical margins will also appear dark on T2 weighted images like T1 weighted images. And the benefit of T2 is that it's very helpful in identifying pathology because most pathological lesions are water-based, uh, deal with bleeding and effusion in, in, in a region. So the images that you see on this slide, uh, these deal with sagittal images of the cervical spine. On the left, we see a T1 and on the right, we see T2. And the one thing that should kind of jump out at you is if we look at the spinal cord, and if we look at the cerebral spinal fluid signal associated with a T1 and T2 weighted image on the right, you note that that spinal cord, uh, anterior and posterior to it, it's bright white or high signal, because that's what we see with respect to fluid on T2. On the left, the T1, you can see that anterior and posterior to the cord uh, is a dark black signal 
uh, very low signal in, in regard to that. Water is going to show up as dark on uh, T1. In terms of fat, uh, fat is going to show up really, really bright on T1 and a little bit darker on T2, and that's going to correlate to the bone that we see on T1 and T2. If you look at those vertebral bodies on T1, they're a little bit higher in signal than the T2 weighted images. And if you also look at the disc as well, uh, you can see disc spaces on both of these images quite nicely. Uh, cortical margins again for bone will show up dark on both T1 and T2. And again, we're always going to get T1 and T2 weighted images combined uh, in an MRI that we see with our patients. There may be other sequences, but T1 and T2 are probably the most prevalent. Just want to take a moment and present a case to you that shows how we might correlate some findings we see on conventional radiography with MRI to help come up with a diagnosis. And so again, uh, MRI is likely going to be used in very, very specific cases, while conventional radiographs are used an awful lot. And so this is a case of a 40-year-old 40 uh, 40 male who was a distance runner, and he was training for a distance event. Uh, his training had increased over the course of the past uh, few weeks, and he was complaining of left-sided hip pain. Left hip uh, and this AP of the pelvis would be on your right. And the x-rays were read as completely normal. And a running athlete who's recently increased the intensity of their training, who complains of hip pain, uh, if you have normal radiographs, radiography is certainly the way to, to, to go to start. But even if you have normal radiographs, um, you'd probably want to go ahead and get magnetic resonance imaging because a femoral neck stress fracture uh, would be in the differential. Um, and in this particular case, this is a T2 weighted uh, MR image, um, a coronal view of both hips and pelvis. And what you see on the right, um, which is the patient's left hip, is you see an area of increased signal intensity at the base of the left femoral neck. And that would be uh, consistent with a non-displaced or an incomplete uh, femoral neck stress fracture. We only see it at the base of the uh, femoral neck, and it doesn't really move up into the superior aspect of the femoral neck. Remember that on these T2-weighted images, fluid is going to be represented by being very bright or high-intensity signal. And what we see here is actually bone marrow edema that's consistent with a fracture. And so, again, this would be consistent with a femoral neck stress fracture. Uh, this patient's going going to have to be offloaded and evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon. Again, in a athletic population, um, especially ones who are increasing the frequency of their training, if we see hip pain in those individuals, a femoral neck stress fracture really has to be in a differential. Um, and they're important to pick up in a timely fashion uh, because they can proceed to a full-blown displaced uh, femoral neck fracture um, in a brief period of time if they're not managed appropriately. Um, and the concern there would be that if we do have these displaced fractures at the femoral neck, uh, our concern now is the blood flow to the femoral head, and we could potentially see cases of avascular necrosis. In fact, anywhere between a third to a half of these individuals who have these displaced femoral neck stress fractures uh, do develop AVN down the road. Again, we see the patient's images in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. Um, and we see, again, that area of increased signal at the base of that left femoral neck. And that's consistent with a compression-sided femoral neck stress fracture. And that's kind of at the middle top of our slide. You can see that, uh, that graphic depiction there of what a compression-sided femoral neck stress fracture would look like. Again, that's an incomplete femoral neck stress fracture. A tensile-sided, uh, tensile or tension-sided femoral neck stress fracture, once again incomplete, would be where we see uh, the uh, fracture line from the uh, top of the femoral neck down. And so 
you'd say, well, how does this matter? Certainly a displaced femoral neck stress fracture, a complete femoral neck stress fracture would be managed surgically. Those tension, those tension or tensile-sided femoral neck stress fractures are typically treated with surgical fixation because when you think about gravity and ground reaction forces, you're always placing tension over that area of the fracture. However, if it's a compression-sided femoral neck stress fracture, we're not too concerned about the effects of gravity and ground reaction forces because it's actually pushing those forces together, pushing the bony aspects together. So the likelihood of that displacing is going to be a lot less. We're still going to have the patient offloaded for a period of time, likely four to six weeks, close uh, follow-up with the physical therapist, but these are patients that are likely going to be managed non-operatively. Again, so just with the imaging findings that we see on MRI, just based upon those basic principles we talked about, that area of increased signal at the base of the femoral neck, that's consistent with the compression-sided femoral neck stress fracture, and this, treat this patient would then be most likely treated with conservative uh, management. And so sometimes it's nice to use some of these memory devices for uh, trying to identify some of the patterns that we see on T1 and T2 weighted images. And so this particular graphic tells you for T1 and T2 to look at the fat. Uh, T1 weighted images, again, the fat is bright white, the water is going to be gray. T2 weighted images, the fat is going to be gray and the water is now going to be white. And so the memory, uh, the memory uh, help on this particular slide is World War II, and that stands for water is white on T2. And so if that helps you remember a little bit better, um, that's great. Um, but sometimes these mnemonics are helpful. But the key again is to know that on those T2s, water does show up bright. And we showed you examples of that on the last couple of slides. And so this chart here just compares the uses for MRI and CT scan. Again, the key with MRI is that it's going to be really good for soft tissue based lesions. Um, this could include things like ligaments, tendons, labrum. Uh, it's also going to be helpful to identify uh, lesions in the brain and spinal cord. Um, it's going to be helpful to identify spinal uh, metastases in terms of neoplasms. And it's good for um, more subacute uh, or chronic evaluation of the brain following cerebrovascular accidents because now we're looking at the effects of ischemia on some of that tissue in the brain. And that's going to change the signal of that. With respect to CT, again, I think the key there is its evaluation of bone. Uh, so it's very, very good at evaluating bone and fractures. It is used, remember the cavities of the abdomen and the chest, the organs that we have in those, they have varying degrees of radio density, so we can pick up, you know, uh, soft tissue disease in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, so CT is good for that, especially in terms of trauma. Um, bony stenosis, uh, especially central canal stenosis, can be evaluated with CT, and it's good for the initial uh, evaluation of a CVA because again, we're looking for, especially in terms of hemorrhagic stroke, uh, because we're looking at, again, different degrees of radio density for things like fluid and water compared to uh, some of the more uh, radio dense structures of the brain. The last of the advanced imaging modalities that we'll talk about is scintigraphy or bone scan. And bone scan is a very interesting and a very useful imaging modality. For this, uh, we'll typically have the patient injected with a radiopharmaceutical substance. Um, and then we wait for that radiopharmaceutical substance to kind of make its way through the body. And what will happen is that you'll see areas of increased uptake uh, in areas of bone that are more metabolically active than others. And so that'll show up on the bone scan. And you'd say, well, why would that potentially happen? Well, that radiopharmaceutical is going to migrate toward these areas of increased bony metabolism. We might see increased bony metabolism in terms of a fracture. Uh, we might see increased bony metabolism in terms of an infection, and we may see increased bony metabolism when we have uh, 
uh, skeletal uh, disease from uh, metastatic cancer. Uh, we have primary cancers in other parts of the body that have now spread to the bone. So bone scan is very helpful in picking up some of these lesions. So we're definitely going to see it in bone because bone is metabolically active. But then as that radiopharmaceutical makes its way out of the body, we'll also see it picked up in the urinary bladder and the kidneys as well. It's a sensitive modality, but not very specific, meaning that if a bone scan comes back as negative, meaning we don't see areas of increased uptake, the likelihood of a fracture or an infection or spinal or I'm sorry, skeletal uh, metastatic disease is likely going to be really, really low. It's not specific though, meaning that I'll show you, meaning that what we see on the scan we see an area of increased uptake, we're not going to be 100% sure what that means to us. And so in terms of uh, bone scan, again, um, when we talk about that um, femoral neck stress fracture, you could have a patient who potentially has a plain film radiograph that's normal, but they still have a concern for a femoral neck stress fracture. Some may recommend doing a bone scan. If the bone scan comes back as normal, there's no femoral neck stress fracture. However, if it comes back as positive with an area of increased uptake in the area of the femoral neck, it's likely going to be a femoral neck stress fracture, but we're not going to have the detail needed to determine whether or not it's a completely displaced femoral neck stress fracture or if it's compression or tension sided. And so that's what we mean by it lacking specificity. And we'll show you some examples of it here in, in the slides coming up. So again, what might, what might bone scans be helpful for? Uh, the first would be evaluation of potential for things like stress fractures um, in patients that have plain films, but the plain films are normal, uh, but we're still concerned about a fracture being present. A bone scan might help uh, for that. Certainly, um, skeletal infections, uh, that's going to wreak havoc on bony metabolism. Those will definitely show up on a bone scan. And then uh, finally, uh, if we're dealing with patients who potentially have primary cancers in areas maybe like the breast, maybe like the lung, maybe like the brain, uh, that potentially have uh, a good chance for spread to the skeletal system, a bone scan is really a nice way to have some understanding of the degree of skeletal metastases that are present. And so this is a bone scan image uh, from a patient who had primary lung cancer uh, with metastatic disease to the spine and the pelvis. And if you look at these two images on the left is an AP view of the body, on the right is a PA view. And if you want to know what does a normal bone scan look like, if you look at the arms and legs, the extremities of this particular patient, you can see a general outline of the skeleton. There's not a ton of detail there, but you can pick up the skeleton. And the reason the skeleton shows up, again, is because our skeletal system is metabolically active. It's always turning over. And so that radiopharmaceutical is going to show up, right? It's going to, it's going to cause uh, those bones to show up on these images. But if you see an area of increase, of increased uptake, you're going to see that area of brightness. That means that we're looking at areas of increased radiopharmaceutical uptake, and that's likely due to increased metabolism of the bone. In this particular case, you know, you can see the pelvis there on the left, on the view on the, uh, on the left, um, I'm sorry, so the image on the left, uh, if you look at where the arrow is, that's the left side of the pelvis there. The image on the right, which is a PA view, uh, the left side of the pelvis is actually where that arrow is as well. And so we're looking at areas of increased uptake in the pelvis as well as the spine. And so if you did an MRI then, you could gain a little more detail on the degree of change in the pelvis and the spine. But this is a nice modality to start uh, to determine where these lesions are, because this is a patient who actually had hip uh, and low back pain. Um, and if we just did an MRI of that region, we would pick it up certainly in the pelvis and the low back, but we wouldn't pick it up 
in these areas in the spine that are more proximal. This patient really didn't have any complaints up in that area as of yet, despite the fact that he has uh, metastatic disease in those regions again. So it really helps you understand the distribution of the lesions, at least in terms of metastatic cancer. The final advanced imaging modality we'll briefly mention will be musculoskeletal ultrasound. And you're going to get introduction and ultrasound and other aspects of the course as well. Um, but it's just important to note that musculoskeletal ultrasound is being used more and more by physical therapists. It's being used for biofeedback. It's being used for evaluation of soft tissue structures around the uh, shoulder, around the elbow, the wrist, the knee, and the ankle. And it's also being used by physical therapists who practice in the area of pelvic health. And so there are multiple different uh, uses for ultrasound in a physical therapy clinic. And again, I think that um, as we begin to see more and more of this being used, uh, we also see it used by physicians as well in terms of point of care, where physicians can now have ultrasound right there in the office with them and do a quick scan of some of these regions. Um, as we know, it's can, it can be used uh, to evaluate, again, the soft tissues of the abdomen. Uh, these images that we see here, these are axial uh, MRI images at the top. And really what they're looking at is the activity of the transverse abdominus muscle during these abdominal drawing in maneuvers. And with an abdominal drawing in maneuver, we should see activation of transverse abdominus where it gets shorter and a little bit thicker while the internal external obliques are turned off. Hopefully they're going to be turned off and we can use that as a means of biofeedback. It isn't uh, practical to use MR imaging for that, but we certainly can use ultrasound for that as well. So the goal here would be and you can see the therapist positioning uh, where the ultrasound head is being positioned. Um, when we look at the images in the bottom, those are ultrasound images of the abdominal wall. And so we see the external internal oblique as well as transverse abdominus. As the patient does an abdominal drawing and maneuver, we see that transverse abdominus shorten and get thicker. And that's exactly what we want to see. Preferential activation of transverse abdominus while internal external oblique are not necessarily necessarily contracting and overpowering uh, the other muscles of the abdominal of the abdominal wall. So again, it's really nice for a biofeedback mechanism, but again, it can be used to evaluate soft tissues. And when you think about ultrasound, it really is the evaluation of superficial soft tissues. So in this presentation, we discussed some of the basics of some of the advanced imaging modalities like MRI, like CT, like bone scan, and we briefly touched on musculoskeletal ultrasound assessment. I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I want to wish you all the best for the remainder of your semester.